send it. And keep sending until the message is clear. That's, I think, the best advice I can give anyone. Yes, very, very good, Frank. Thank you. Uh, question from on the chat. How about hearings in chambers? Can the judge still change the form, you know, when we were talking about the court issues? Well, that's their chapel when you speak to a judge. And I know that it might sound exciting to go and talk to a judge in chambers. And there may be judges that want to. And I, 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 I feel in future there will be more and more judges in the coming weeks and months that will want to request a hearing in chambers. But um, a hearing in chambers is a double-edged sword. Remember, that judge has spent a long, long time and is by definition someone that usually is considered quite intelligent. And unless you are on top of exactly what you're doing, you may expose yourself uh, in such a fashion uh, to show that you are not as competent as you may have claimed, uh, that you do not fully understand what you're dealing with, and if a judge gets whiff of those things, may then use that knowledge um, when you return. Remember, a judge is not calling into chambers because he likes you, because he wants to help you. He's calling into chambers because the judge at that point is struggling to find a way to beat you. So don't be sucked into the I'm your friend and I'm here to help you, like I'm an attorney and I'm here to represent you. No. <laughs> so the short answer is uh, if you're requested, uh, you may choose to go, but don't see it as a fireside chat or a way to chinwag or prove. Uh, your hubris or any kind of um, cockiness could well be uh, the cause of uh, failure. But um, I wouldn't shirk from it. I wouldn't want to run away from it, but treat it for what it is. Uh, it is nowhere near uh, a fact that you're winning. It is merely a judge trying to explore how to beat you. Yes. Thank you, Frank. All right. Um, I don't know if Michael Joseph can come back on uh, a line. He's put in a couple of questions here. If I give up my original, I'm, I'm sure that means document like summons or warrant hopefully Michael just uh, let me know if we're off base here can that not be interpreted as a grant uh, okay uh, well it's important I think okay in originals copies um, is, is relevant because they use words like extract certified copy original to us all the time um, it's actually a ruse uh, a bank can monetize a piece of tissue paper if they wanted to, and it's perfectly lawful. In fact, they monetize things that have been photocopied, faxed, and smeared a hundred times over, and have done all the time. So whether something's an original or a copy is immaterial in their system, totally immaterial. Um, what is material is whether the document uh, is the uh, form of execution um, or is a copy of execution. So if I'm talking about a deed, the form that conveys property is considered a deed. Now, it may not have deed on it, but most deeds are supposed to have somewhere on it the word deed. That's just a general rule in their system. A deed is a deed. It's, it is the form to convey property. So if I'm going to grant a right or convey a right, then it needs to be in the form of a deed. Um, and unless the deed has some uh, originating um, uh, form to it, then um, no. Um, in the case of the ecclesiastical deed poll, we are sending originals, but in no way are we conveying, can it be construed as conveying any right at all. Now, deeds are very clear, and the rules of deeds are very clear. Unless you state clearly, grant give, consent, then you are not consenting, you are not granting, you are not gifting. So unless those words are used in the context of a conveyance, then you are not granting, giving or conveying um, anything. 
So if you read the deed poll very carefully, um, it in fact is not uh, uh, gifting or conveying any property rights of the trust. Uh, it is using words to effectively convey uh, rights um, that relate to um, where we stand in, and, and, uh, and an agreement to where we stand um, in their system. So they're rights that, in fact, the recipient is agreeing to, not us. And that's what makes the deed poll very powerful. Once they receive it, unless they rebut it and they can't because of its form, then we have a binding deed and contract where they agree to the fact that the Cessna KV uh, can't stand. They agree to the fact to give an accounting. They agree to the fact that uh, we don't accept coercive or punitive benefits. They agree to the fact that we have a superior trust position. They agree to the fact that we're a trustee. That is what we're doing. Okay, very good. Uh, also, uh, for Michael Joseph, why would I not set my own boundaries and borders around my own issue? Uh, question mark. And then private question mark. Do not, I hope, for anyone, and this is going to be one of the most difficult things for people. I know, look, there are people who have been doing things for 20 years and 30 years and longer. And when I approach this, I really do approach it with enormous respect for each and every person who's been um, battling. But if you materially alter even a fraction of the deed poll, other than replacing your name, then it is no longer a deed poll. It is no longer part of divine law. And you are dealing as a single individual without any of the force, support, power, or influence of any of this. You are going back to one man or woman battling the entire system. Do not change a single thing. Now, if something inside you is almost overwhelmingly compelling you to say, but I do not do anything without me giving it my own twist, maybe that voice that says, I don't do anything but my own twist, needs to be very carefully looked at because here is a very specific and clear instruction. This cannot be altered without fundamentally changing its effect. There are many things that you can do of your own. For example, I've said to, to a number of calls, by the time you've read the canon law three or four times, trying to remember the words will become immaterial because what you will feel is a vibration. That vibration is the fact that the word has become you and you have become the word. In other words, you won't need to worry about what it says word for word on documents or property or CESTA KV. You'll, you'll know it, and how you say it in court will be your own. Now, that's a classic example of using your wisdom in oration, in speaking, to strength. But when it comes to written form, it is a very dangerous, and I have to say, because there's no other word to say, foolish thing to consider changing material form when it is made patently clear that by doing so you are creating an entirely different and inferior system. So speaking, absolutely. Speaking, there's nothing stronger than a man or woman that knows the law to the point that they can use in their own words and express in their own way their competence because that is the strongest proof of competence you can ever see in a court. But when we're talking about form, do not deviate one inch, please. Okay, Frank. This might be a good spot to put in uh, an explanation and talk about the blue, the, uh, blue paper at, that is also included with the ecclesiastical depot because this is um, possibly – you know, with the with some of the ways, and these are good questions um, because these are things that we're even encountering uh, currently uh, about establishing boundaries on on your uh, on the documents. And so, if you, this would be a good spot, I, it seems that it would be a good spot. I don't know what you think about explaining the the blue paper. Sure. 
Um, like, why is it on blue? Well, it, it, it does explain in the in the um, in the Cayman's why, but but I'll, I'll just give the history of it quickly. The quick history. Um, at the turn of the century, I think it was about 1908. Uh, there used to be a court that the uh, Roman cult established, and they uh, squashed it at the Council of Trent in uh, was 1545 around that period. It was called the uh, Sacred Rota, or the Rota Romana. Uh, and the purpose of the Rota, um, and Rota meaning the wheel, torture wheel, was to um, hear um, matters, jurisdictional matters, a bit like the Supreme Court. So the highest court uh, is the uh, Curia, the highest judge is the Pope. So one down from that was the Rota, and the Rota would hear disputes in territory and uh, vassals of the Roman cult, uh, and it was closed down. But in 1908, they reconstituted it again. But instead of putting physical living beings on this rota, they did something really tricky. They stated that the court was in session with 12, and they call them 12 apostolic proto-notaries. So that's 12 apostolic proto-notaries. Now, <laughs> The word apostolic and the number 12 hopefully should be obvious to, to most people that we're talking about um, something equating the apostles. And that's precisely what they did. <clears throat> Without being obvious about it, what the writer claimed from 1908 is that the 12 apostles are sitting in judgment on behalf of the Roman cult in a spiritual court called the Sacred Rota, the Rota Roman, every second of every day, because the court is in session all the time, and of course they're spirits, so they don't need to go to the toilet or sleep. And that court then grants certain powers to courts around the world. So when those courts want to use those powers, those superior powers, the instruments are issued under certain colour, yellow and blue. Blue being the most traditional, Robin and blue being the most traditional colour for the claiming power of the curia and uh, the uh, rota. So when you have a proto-notary judge in a district courthouse he or she is claiming their power from the writer. So let's look at the logic, and this is where it comes in. And this comes to the heart of anyone that says, oh, I still don't believe that they've closed common law. That's not true. I believe in the romantic notion. Well, well let's look at it. If I want to arrest you, then under common law, I'm really entering in negotiation if I'm really talking about common law right. I'm saying I've come to arrest you for this reason, uh, and then, yes, it's all very civil, and off you go. But if I'm coming to your home with a SWAT team, and I'm bashing down the door, and I'm shooting your dog, and I'm scaring the children, well, I'm not coming to negotiate. I'm coming to enforce. I'm coming um, with jackboots. Now, if I want to justify that with law, I need something with a little bit more oomph than common law. I need something that says I have been granted a God-given right to do that. Well, that's exactly what the rota did. And the canon law in 1917 was the first time they used it. And it's been so successful that they've souped it up in the 1983 version. So what happens is the proto notaries issue warrants of arrest using the full ecclesiastical powers of the rota. Well, they're using spiritual and supernatural powers against us to arrest us. They're saying that the apostles, Jesus, God, <clears throat> has given us a right to arrest you. That's how they arrest you. That's how they imprison you. And that's why we're using ecclesiastical blue. How's that? Okay? Yes, that was very good. Thank you, Frank. Um, another question. Does the use of the driver's license give you liability or claiming ownership of it? Does the use of the driver's license 
give you liability. Well, in their system, uh, what they do,